Thank you very much. So we have time for a good discussion now. Uh, yes, Rudolf Moradian. Expansion. Uh, hello? Expansion is connected with uh, linear uh, velocity, yes, the, with the first derivative. Uh, acceleration with second derivative. Can you ima imagine that uh, sometimes it is possible to, uh, to find in universe the th third derivative? <laughs> In fact, uh, one, of the, one of the aspects of that, of that uh, history that I showed you is, if you think about it, is going from a deceleration to an acceleration. So we know that there is, uh, if, you know, assuming those, those measurements are what we're showing, there is a third derivative um, the, uh, you know, called the jerk. Um, and in fact, uh, one of the very first uh, papers on this was uh, you know, called Measuring the Cosmic Jerk, um, which uh, people were very careful to point out we were not referring to anybody in particular. <laughs> Martin. Uh, a question and a comment. Um, the question is, um, uh, if we didn't have the evidence from the microwave background and the Doppler peak for a flat universe, how strongly does your data alone rule out a omega um, 0.3 slightly decelerating universe? At the time uh, when we did the, uh, the original measurement, um, the as I, as I mentioned, you know, those first 50 supernova uh, were all less well measured than any of the current you know, uh, 1,200. Um, and at that time, the, there was still a loophole. Uh, there was still a few percent probability um, that if the universe were you know, able to not be flat, if it, were, if it was strongly curved, um, that you could evade uh, the, this, this particular measurement and not have a, a, expanding un a, a accelerating universe or a cosmological constant. Um, but it was only a couple of years later that the first balloon measurements um, saw indications that we lived in a reasonably flat universe. And as soon as that was in play, then the, those, those few percent went down to a, you know, a part in 10 to the 4 uh, you know, uh, very quickly. So, so you're saying it needed the CMB measurements in order to make it really convincing, you're saying? Yes, so, so for me, that was the moment where I felt like we had the first, uh, the first strong confirmation um, uh, at, at that stage. Um, you know, it was, it was uh, still, you know, uh, you know, it was only like a percent um, uh, or, or so, um, you know, a percent or two that you could, you could sneak in. Um, on the other hand, you know, since everybody's always concerned about systematics of various sorts, um, we, we felt much safer once you got to the point where you knew that you lived in the flat universe. Yes. And my comment is really a sort of gripe about the, uh, the famous pi diagram which shows 70% dark energy, et cetera, uh, which implies it must be the most important feature. Now, it is in fundamental physics terms, but in terms of astrophysics, the dark energy is much less important than the dark matter because uh, it doesn't dominate at early times. Indeed, it doesn't dominate at relatively large than one, whereas the dark matter is five times as important as the baryons all the way back. And so, that means that we can't understand galaxy formation at all without the dark uh, matter. But whether the dark energy was there or not would make hardly any difference to any of the morphology of galaxies and clusters. So in that sense, the dark matter is still the most important thing for astrophysicists, although that, that's right. metal physicists, it's the other way around. No, anyway, from, from a local point of view, um, it, that's one of the reasons why it's so hard actually to do anything with it, sure. because it's, it, it, uh, it, it doesn't seem to um, have, we don't expect it to have any real effect right. on anything um, on, a, on a scale except these gigantic scales uh, and, and over gigantic amounts of time. Uh, any other question? Yes, Philip? I want to return to this question uh, that you raised about the, uh, the accuracy of the, the supernova as standard candles. And when you first introduced the idea, you said, well, they're pretty much the same. And then you expanded about how these different uh, time-dependent spectra. Uh, so I, I assume that the point is that different time-dependent spectra reach different um, uh, maximum brightnesses. So then the question is, how do you determine that the same spectrum produces the same standard brightness. Is that by looking at multiple supernovae in the same galaxy so that you know 
uh, that at least they're from the same distance? You, you, can, you can do that, um, but in fact, uh, what, what these kinds of studies do is you look at uh, many supernovae in the nearby Hubble flow where, the, uh, where the, the difference of the different cosmologies doesn't matter. We know that basically the expansion rate um, is, is you know, is very constant in the, in the nearby Hubble flow. So there, I mean, you know the relative distance quite well of different galaxies that are in that flow. Ah. And, uh, and the um, improvement that we're getting is that, you know, the difference between, let's say, a 15% oh, a dispersion in the, in the brightnesses, uh, you know, random brightnesses of these uh, supernova, uh, down to something that's probably below um, 7%. Um, or, or even even uh, even smaller, it could, you know, it could it could turn out to be uh, you know uh, negligible. Um, but we haven't yet gotten the the system all the systematic errors down that small. Okay, but you're looking, if I understand correctly, you're looking for a much more substantial improvement than that in order to answer some of these um, unanswered questions about what the nature of, of dark ah. energy is at early times. You've ah. got to do. So, yeah. Yes. So, what are so your prospects. Right. So I mentioned twenty. I mentioned a twenty times in, improvement yeah. er, earlier. Right. So there's um, there's many. So this is one of the many steps on the error budget, and uh, and this one um, we believe it's it's uh, it's good enough um, to, uh, when put together with all the other steps that we've improved in the in the error budget. And so that's that's where, really where we're we're getting the advantage. What's what's particularly important for this one? The reason that we felt that this was important is not so much for its improvement in the um, dispersion. Um, we thought it was much more important for the, for the fact that we'll be able to identify um, evolution if we're seeing a, um, the population of supernova drifting from one kind of, of type 1a supernova to another. And so, uh, so for our purposes, you can use hundreds of them and average them together, but you want to make sure that when you average them together that you've averaged it down to the same, yeah. to the same kind of supernova here and there. And so we take advantage of, of statistics combined with this. Do you know what it is that makes one supernova different from another? The, the, the theorists um, can do first principle supercomputer um, explosions of the supernova, and they can um, show that you get behaviors that are similar to what supernova actually look like, and they can say, oh, so for example, here's where you know, this spectral line gets a little deeper, and here's where it gets a little bit shallower, and you see those actual effects um, in the real supernova. But it's also fair to say that the matches are not great. You can't predict a supernova yet. Um, you, you can't actually um, do it completely theoretically. So you use this combination of, of, of empirical uh, and then use the theory to inform how do you identify each of each these different lines is coming from. Well, well what I'm wondering is what, what kinds of things could oh. go into making a supernova different, just initial mass yes. or, say, how far baryogenesis had gone before it's... It, what are the kinds it's, of things that matter? Uh, yeah, it's, it's usually a mix of um, how old the galaxy is and uh, how many generations of stars have, uh, have produced the heavy elements. So the, you know, the elements that are, you know, uh, that are called the metallicity in, by astronomers, um, are, you know, all, all the, uh, the slightly heavier elements and, and, the, um, and those uh, definitely come in different, uh, you, know, it, 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 you can actually plot the brightness of the supernova as a function of the metallicities and we see effects. Um, you can plot it as a function of age and mass of the galaxies, which is also a, uh, a age uh, indicator, and uh, and you find that um, they do fall in, in different ranges, um, just slightly. These are you know these are small corrections. Um, so we b we believe it's just the uh, the initial composition of the star that underwent that particular explosion. Yeah. Well, I think we'll stop there for uh, half an hour coffee break. Uh, thank you to the speakers again, and we reconvene at 5.20. Uh, <coughs>